Good afternoon, everyone. Would you kindly take your seats? We're getting to the end of a very, very exciting conference. Um, this uh, closing plenary is a special one. Um, this is about what is the role of universities in global health? And we could not get a better panel than what we have here. Um, Dr. Harvey Feinberg will be moderating the session. And um, I will not do introductions. You all have the bio sketches of every speaker. Um, so I'll let you have Dr. Feinberg moderate this session. Thank you very much, Jaime. Good afternoon, everyone. It's very, very good to be able to be here with you, and especially with this eminent group of leaders of universities. Uh, Dr. Ram, who is the vice chancellor at Kathmandu, I understand is making his first visit to the United States on this occasion. So we are very, very honored. Very honored, Dr. Ram, to have you with us uh, on this occasion especially. Uh, everyone in California certainly, and in the United States more broadly, is very familiar with the president of the University of California, Janet Napolitano, and it is a great honor to have you with us also, <laughs> President Napolitano, thank you. Uh, and in the field of global health, if you had to advance someone in the field to be among university presidents, what better candidate could you imagine than Julio Frank? And so we're very privileged to have an opportunity to hear from the three of you in the course of this hour. And I wonder at the beginning, and I might turn first uh, to you, Julio, uh, you who have been so immersed in the field and even in developing the field of global health, what is it that you feel is the essence of the field and how does that relate to universities? <clears throat> this is the great thing of having unbiased friends when they introduce you. Uh, thank you, <laughs> my dear friend. and. Thank you also to our dear friend Jaime Sepulveda for the invitation, and it's of course great uh, to see here Haile de Vaz, who's the person um, who's uh, had the great idea of forming this consortium of universities. That's exactly what, what we're all about. It's a consortium of universities in global health. I think the, you know, the question of this panel, which is what is the role of universities, the first role of universities, which is a very important role, is to frame questions. Universities are about providing meaning and structure so that we understand reality, which is usually much more complex. And, and that's where you know, we start defining fields like global health. Um, and, and, and so I, I think a first role for universities is to, to provide clarity of concept, clarity of thinking, because I always like to say that clear thinking is a requisite for effective action. Um, and it is very important when we talk about global health to, to, to have, a, uh, I think, a, a, a clear uh, concept of, of, of that notion, because we're still living under the influence of the concept of international health. And very often, particularly in developed countries, one finds that global health really means foreign health. It's whatever we are doing where we're not in our home country. Um, I think that's, that's not global health. In my view, global health comprises the understanding of the implications of interdependence for health. That's, to me, the key idea. And we've moved from a view of uh, international health that very often pr proposed dependence, um, uh, meaning that we would send people, that this was a lot about creating a, a, a sort of view of the world where problems flowed from south to north, and solutions flow from north to south. And therefore, it's a dependent base, it's a dependence view. We moved uh, to, especially after World War II and the post-colonial period, 
to an idea of independence where each country would develop its own capabilities. And I think we're now fully into the era of interdependence. One of President John F. Kennedy's best speech calls for a declaration of interdependence. It's a July 4th speech. And, and this is wh where we are. And global health, to me, is exactly about understanding that events happening anywhere in the world affect the rest of the world. That is the concept of interdependence. And that every country, even the most powerful country, even the richest corporation, does not have full control of all events, and that therefore we need our collective, our global collective action to deal with common threats and common challenges. And um, universities therefore are key there because we do produce this quintessential ingredient uh, to manage the challenges of interdependence, which is called knowledge. And it's through knowledge that we improve the world, that we understand it first, we conceptualize it, we understand, we discover it, the elements of its complexity, and then we are empowered to act on that. But having this first uh, notion of global health as the understanding, the study, and action on the implications of interdependent for health, I think is a fundamental first step. Well, thank you very much, Julio. Uh, you know, I was very taken in uh, your talk that you've delivered at your investiture at, as president of the University of Miami, the talk just in January, the turn of phrase you used that when we talk about study abroad, we really should be saying study within, because it's study within another culture, another frame, and it's very consistent with your notion of the interdependence. Uh, but Dr. Ram, uh, you came to the ideas and work of global health through your own experience. Uh, could you share with us a little bit about how you came to the idea and ideals of, of global health in your, own, in your own life and experience? Harvey, thank you very much. I am very honored to be here among you, eminent uh, personalities at the dais. Uh, simply what I firmly believe, now talking about global, I am ex trying to explain you how I feel about global, talking about my person. Uh, I always believed that the body can be local, but the mind is always global from my young age. So having the excellent education, entire education in Europe, I wanted to be there where most of the people can feel my presence in good way. As a medical doctor, I am professionally surgeon. I happened to be in Austria, so I came back to Nepal, where I was born and grown up. At the very beginning, we started a small community hospital with a mission, quality healthcare service for the poor, because in Nepal, 90% of people are poor. So we always considered and believed that uh, health, quality health service can be also affordable to everybody. This is only possible because of the collaborations, partnering with other institutions. Like-minded partners are everywhere in the world so community health became public health, and now today, is because of the availability of IT and other resources, it became global. I came yesterday morning in the US for the first time, and jogging here around San Francisco, 200 days ago, this must be also a small global community, global town, global city, now it is a well-known global village for the world, San Francisco. And talking about global health, I think uh, let's talk, like uh, Julio has mentioned, it has multifaceted interdisciplinary approach. I can just share one example. Being a medical doctor, I wanted to treat my patients who are suffering from tuberculosis or COPD. But unless and until I can't er eradicate the cause of those diseases, we don't have a smoking-related, much tuberculosis or COPD, but smoke-related, not smoking, but cooking. Mm -hmm. So I have to deal with uh, experts who knows about mechanical engineers. This is the way how we've developed from one place to another place. One community to another community, turning into the public matter, 
And now here I am present in the global leaders dealing with the global health. That's point one. And point two, as Mr. President has mentioned, how we can work together. I think knowledge has no boundary at all so far. I know and I believe, and you also believe. We can create one global community. A small part is already here. Within 10 years, having the networking of so far away reaching intercontinental members, what could be more development? What could be more asset than what we are witnessing here today? So to make it more global, how we want to proceed further in coming 10 years. One thing I want to say here, often we talk about presentations, writing papers, research. But I think I firmly believe that the implementation is a little better even about the knowledge we create. Now talking about the university and collectively we are here, I think university is always universal, it is always global. The knowledge we share is universal. The facts we enjoy is universal. But the implementation is different. Global health, almost 80% of the world is needing global health, maybe more than the United States. We need to create one community that can join the creations with the need. Then it's a complete global health. Let's believe in implementation outpacking the knowledge, transporting the knowledge to those areas where the need is most. So maybe 80% of the world is needing the global health. The creation is done in 20%. We talk about cheap or expensive. We talk about difficult or easy to have access of global health. But if the creation can be multiplied in different places where the need is the most, I think everything, no matter how big the quality is, can be made cheaper accessible. This is firmly, that's also the reason why I'm here to share my views. I think you will have many different questions. Feel comfortable. I will be very happy even if you ask me my personal, uh, very personal questions to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ram. <laughs> I think we are looking at this question partly from the point of view of the way global health gets expressed from the point of view of the university's programs and needs, and partly how a university can serve in the goals, in meeting the goals of global health itself. Uh, Janet, before you were president of the University of California, you served as a secretary of Homeland Security. You were a governor of a border state. Uh, you've had a lot of experience in your own career that brought you up against certain aspects of global health, I'm sure. I wonder if you could share how your own thinking about what the field is at all uh, is shaped by your own experience in this. Well, thank you, Harvey, and, and welcome, everybody. And it's a delight to be on the panel. I, I was just thinking, uh, Dr. Nod, and listening to you and, uh, and to Julio uh, about my experiences, and they, and, and they have varied. I, I can't keep a job, I guess, and, and they, they move. Uh, uh, but we first uh, met as uh, when I was governor of Arizona, a border state, uh, looking at the relationship between health issues in Mexico and Arizona, and particularly along the border from a public health uh, perspective. Um, uh, as the Secretary of Homeland Security, um, Almost barely before we had walked in the door, we started hearing reports of a strange new virus um, that had the potential to be the next 1918 epidemic. And of course, that was H1N1. There was no vaccine, et cetera. Uh, and if there's anything that would persuade you that the world is, is one big interdependent place, uh, it's thinking about pandemic pandemic and all of the health and logistical issues uh, relevant to that. And then you come to a place like the University of California, which is this, this um, huge uh, research enterprise uh, that carries with it a public service mission. Uh, it's part, it's baked into 
our DNA? Uh, and how do you mobilize that in, in a global health perspective that recognizes the interdependence, that recognizes that bodies may be physically in one place, but the, the mind and thoughts, et cetera, can travel. Um, uh, institutionally, uh, we have uh, the UC Global Health Institute, which is comprised of faculty and researchers and postdocs, grad students, uh, uh, all of whom are involved in some aspect of uh, global health. Um, because collaboration and the interdisciplinary nature of things is, is, is so, so evident here. I'm not sure that uh, we, we have uh, identified the best mechanisms for uh, getting to, to, from point to point uh, and getting to implementation. Uh, but I, I do think, um, if you think of uh, the world as one great big interdependent Place and the University of California, uh, smaller but in the same same vein, a, a very interdependent place. Then having a way institutionally to center global health, uh, to be thinking about it, talking about it, researching in the field makes a lot of sense. The uh, university, of course, every university comes to the field from the vantage point of where it begins as an institution. Uh, the three institutions that are represented here are each distinct and in its own way different, yet sharing the name of university. Uh, university of California is a vast system throughout the whole state with a history, as you mentioned, of the public service. The University of Miami, now 90 years young, is a university that has been expanding its scope and reach. In Kathmandu, your university started just a quarter century ago, approximately, 25 years. And uh, there, with the seven faculties that you have, still the most prominent is in the health area, uh, an area uh, that you began. Uh, Julio, from your vantage point uh, at the University of Miami, with all of the background you brought uh, in global health, how do you see global health expressing itself within uh, your university? And what do you see as some of the opportunities, perhaps, that uh, the confluence of the field and how it's moving and the university and its strengths can be mobilized together? As, as a general statement, I, I do think that a global health can play an enormously valuable role within universities because it is a unifying theme. Um, you know, we live in this world where, if you know, the way I think about health in populations, in this case the global population, is we, we understand the health conditions that affect those populations and then the, the response from society to those. And if you think about that, almost every field of the, a university is involved in one or both of those big categories. When we talk about health conditions, the big construct to me, the, the, the element, the distinctive element of interdependence is the global transfer of health risks, um, which happens on a daily basis and then takes this dramatic shape when it, it's expressed, for example, in a pandemic. But, you know, if, if you think about that, that's certainly a public health issue, but every time we have a pandemic, it becomes a security issue, and no wonder the Secretary of Homeland Security was directly involved because this was, in addition to being a huge public health crisis, it was a national security issue, as Ebola has been, as Zika is likely to become. Uh, so you cannot understand, th a lot of those transfers are related to patterns of trade and consumption. A lot of them are related to the transfer, the fact that not just people and microbes move, but also lifestyles and ideas. As you were saying, you know, our, our thoughts are everywhere, including um, thoughts that are not very health conducive, like smoking and, and uh, unhealthy diets, or the transfer of risks that em emanates from differential environmental and occupational safety standards when you know firms displace um, activities to, to lower regulatory settings. That's the health conditions. But if you look at the side of the way we respond, there is a global health system. 
And I do think universities are a key part of the global health system because they produce this quintessential global public good, as I was saying before, which is knowledge. We are in, in, involved in the entire circle of knowledge. We produce new knowledge, we create new knowledge through research, and that has underpinned most of the health improvements that we've seen since the beginning of the 20th century, the dramatic doubling of life expectancy, is mostly due to advances in knowledge. We deal with the, not just the creation of knowledge, but the recreation through education. So we universities produce the vast majority of the health workforce. The health workforce is now you know, millions of people around the world who are specialized and devoted to this social function of, uh, of uh, preserving health and, uh, and treating disease. Um, we then are involved in the translation of knowledge, whether it's into technologies, into producing vaccines or drugs or increasingly apps uh, that will improve health, or whether it is evidence that then guides decision making. So we in the universities traverse the entire circle of knowledge, and when we translate knowledge and knowledge leads to action, we change the world and we close the circle, and we are back into the production of new knowledge. Universities are present in every step of the way. And when you look at the size of health problems, the size of, you know, say, a pandemic, and then you look at this differentiated global health system, it's a major sector of the economy. It's an arena for huge political issues. You cannot understand diplomacy today without uh, understanding health. You cannot understand global economics. You cannot understand culture and interpretative frameworks. This is an arena where some of the most fundamental ethical questions of our time are asked and sometimes answered. Every part of the university is involved in that. So, you know, health has become way too important to be left only to doctors and nurses and other health professionals. Everyone is involved in health. So global health at the University of Miami, but I see this everywhere else, has that force of being a connector across uh, different parts of the university. And I think that's very important. In my university in particular, we are blessed with what I call a great geographic endowment. The university is the University of Miami. It's not a university in Miami. It's the University of Miami. And being the University of Miami means that it is located in one of the most cosmopolitan cities of the world. Uh, and it is also a crossroads across the entire hemisphere and from there through the whole world. So I've been you know, say, uh, articulating uh, the aspiration of becoming a hemispheric university in the sense of really being a force for integration across the new world and through that to the rest of the world. And um, you know, maybe later we can talk, how, how do you actually organize for that? How do you think organizationally of universities when, when you embrace a, a global view that's based on the notion of interdependence where we can all learn from each other, where it's not that we have the knowledge and the world out there needs us, it's that we all benefit from, from a framework of, uh, of complementarity and, and, and shared learning. Thank you very much, Julio. Uh, Dr. Ram, many students from elsewhere would love and do go to Nepal to spend a month or two to learn, but your students from Nepal also are practicing day in and day out in their local communities in a way that serves the needs of the people of Nepal. Indeed, that, you said, was your motive for coming back uh, from your studies in Europe to bring that knowledge and expertise to the service of your people. Do you think that your students think of themselves as part of the global health enterprise, or do they think of themselves as part of a local health enterprise, and is there any difference? Thank you very much. Uh, very uh, touchy questions to me. Uh, one thing, uh, global health for me is uh, then complete when you can address the need of the people living no matter where they are in which community. I think we are here, we firmly should believe we are not, not anymore local communities. We are the global citizen of the earth. The technique, the possibilities are like this today. No matter what you enjoy here at that particular moment with a click, we can also enjoy 8,000 kilometers away. It is not only talking about infectious disease or other related disease. Liver is liver, heart is heart. No matter who, live where. Nature is the same, what we enjoy the most. Talking about our students, I firmly believe that if you can motivate the recipient of your knowledge, accident knowledge, 
to be there where the need is most. That's a successful knowledge sharing. That's a global, that's globally held. The reason I am simply saying is completion of the knowledge is only then complete when you can see the result. And talking about the university, university is a creation of knowledge, knowledge creation center. We do have one, not only teaching learning, we do have also research. We do have also some possibilities to test whether the research is correct or not. That's part one of the university. And second, we have to encourage people the good result of the research done to address the need of the people. The reason I am telling this to you all is this is my life. This is what I firmly believed being almost 15 years living in Europe. Now I'm 20 years back to Nepal. I was serving a small community where 500,000 people used to live without any single doctor 20 years ago. And today, almost 2.2 million populations are getting the service of a small community hospital believed to have a mission, quality healthcare service for the poor. And so, university, again back to university, quality can be sustained only if you can teach and explain your dream to the youth, young people as your students. If they understand what you have in your mind, also concerning global health, they will carry on much more longer than you and I live in this earth. I think simply we have to encourage people, people living in the city, the need is most in the community, no matter whether it is in US, Africa, or Asia. We have to bring these two poles together, and global is only then global if we can bring these two points together to meet each other. I think about the modalities, about how to proceed to transport this dream, there are many more experts here today. And let's believe in one thing. Two things are the pillar of to sustain our dream. One is whatever we want to share, it should be quality, especially concerning health. If it is quality health, without discrimination, without looking at the pocket money, if it's a quality, I think it will sustain. And second, if we invest our dream of quality to the youth, they will understand your dream in the form of education at the university or primary level, they will again, the second pillar to carry on. So let's value these two things, you know, about many things. I am talking about this especially because, you know, country like Nepal, in many countries in Asia or Europe, um, Africa, often we talk about what we hear and what we read, but I want to urge you to believe what you see and touch. And that should be the component of global health. We can develop curriculum. We can develop together also methodology. We can also evaluate together. Together, I think we can always multiply our strength. And even if there are some weaknesses, we can half it. That's why collaboration is needed and global health, the concept global health, the dream global health is very, very important today's, in the today's world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ram. Uh, your mentioning of the idea of collaboration and cooperation uh, brings me to a question I, I did want to ask also to the panel, and uh, Janet, maybe start uh, with you, which is about the relations of the university to others outside in the field of global health. Uh, which one strategically do you feel are most important or most successful for the University of California in fulfilling its objectives and also in contributing through the university to the solution of global health problems? Well, I think, um, first of all, um, part of what uh, universities do is educate. Uh, and and uh, I hope that our, particularly our undergraduates um, who enter into the field of global health, which is a really becoming quite popular I think when they start, they have this idea that, that all of the answers will be discovered here and they will send them to the rest of the world. Um, and uh, I hope by the time they graduate, they have a different uh, uh, perspective, which is to say that uh, the peoples of the globe are uh, 
related in, in so many ways and, and health is a unifying force. Um, and that process um, is uh, one of the things we should, we should cons constantly remind ourselves of in terms of how the university um, interacts outside itself with, with other agencies. Um, obviously, they're the relevant uh, federal agencies, um, uh, HHS, uh, FEMA. Uh, uh, in some respects, uh, you go uh, uh, to the Department of State, um, uh, the other agencies that are dealing internationally. Then you get into the various UN and UN-associated um, agencies, the WHO, and I'm and just very I think interesting kind of thing to think about is, is the WHO really positioned and empowered in this day and age to have the role that it is supposed to play. Uh, and then of course with other agencies or uh, other, excuse me, universities and research institutes uh, across the globe. And what are the best ways to uh, convene uh, those entities? I I'll just close. Uh, uh, this by saying that technology and the rise of different kinds of technology, the um, ability for international travel and, and the capacity for that, all of those Im improvements um, have, have made this field of global health so much more uh, logistically manageable uh, for universities and for our students. These, uh, this is a very wide array of potential relationships and partnerships. If you just concentrate on this uh, question of university to university relations, from that point of view, uh, is it important for the University of California for its own mission to have partnerships with other universities, or do you see it mainly as part of, if you will, the service responsibility of the University of California to be of assistance to others? Um, I, no, I would say the former. And I would use as examples uh, partnerships with uh, UNAM uh, and, and other universities in Mexico. We share a border with Mexico. There's a, a lot of historic and, and cultural uh, relations uh, uh, between Mexico and California. Um, uh, we're, we are uh, undertaking some work in Cuba uh, and uh, in that connection, I'm sure we'll be working with the University of Miami. Uh, I said that right, right, Julio? Yes. Okay. Uh, um, and, and, and that's important. So I think as we think about different um, uh, health issues in different parts of the globe, it opens up different uh, thoughts about, well, what institutions are the best partners? Well, I think I just heard an offer, Julio. You should definitely <laughs> leap in to accept okay. because as big as Miami is, trust me, it's not as big as of California. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but tell me, uh, from your vantage point, uh, how do you think about collaborations with, with partners? And within the university, how, what does it serve from the interests of the university? You know, um, I think um, we've lagged in the reality of interdependence with respect to the organizational forms we've developed. We mostly rely still on conventional forms of in, you know, multilateral organizations, but I think we need to create more horizontal um, uh, associations or consortia. I mean, I love the name of our organization, consortium. Um, you know, as, as you know, Harvey, because you were a member of this, um, I had the honor of co-chairing with Lincoln Chen a uh, a Lancet Commission on the Education of Health Professionals for the 21st Century, and we call for global forms of organization to reflect this notion of interdependence. You know, if anyone thinks that each one of the 194 member states of WHO is going by itself to completely educate its full complement of required health professionals and carry out through its universities the entirety of all the research that it's required, I think that's a fantasy that's just not going to happen. I would even submit that, that most universities today in developing countries are incapable of being excellent in every single field because of the explosion of knowledge. I think we need to take the step of developing global forms of organization 
Um, so, you know, one of the ideas I've been now pushing at the University of Miami is the idea of a, of a, a hemispheric university consortium. And I use the word consortium to signify something much more than a partnership or, you know, the study abroad <laughs> programs that you were alluding to, uh, the student exchange. We should continue to do all of that. But I'm talking of much, much stronger forms of identifying complementarities where, you know, through uh, both regional centers of excellence, which are a form of global organization, and global, uh, um, uh, you know, we, we've used the word transnational sometimes with a negative uh, connotation because we, we, we think of transnational corporations. We should start thinking of transnational universities which are come out of a consortium. I personally, I want to make this very clear, do not believe in the model of universities in rich countries building campuses abroad. I, other universities I respect a lot have followed that model. That's not the model we're going to follow. I believe in functional collaborations in the form of a consortium, uh, you know, m my dream would be that we would have a relatively free movement of students and faculty in, you know, in a structured way, in an integrated way, not just, you know, sending people uh, for summers abroad, study abroad, but a much more integrated uh, experience. The way I think about it, I'm talking of the hemisphere, and the hemisphere includes the entire hemisphere, so we would love to <laughs> have a consortium with the University of California, which of course would be the senior partner, since it's a much, much, <laughs> much larger university than the University of Miami. But, but you in know, the same hemisphere. But in the same hemisphere. <laughs> and, and through that, you know, by hemisphere, I mean a, a focus that then connects to the rest of the world. Um, because, you know, the reason we call this hemisphere the new world is because all of the old world is in here. Um, you know, Africa is in here through the forced migration that was represented by slavery. Uh, the, you know, ev every part of the world, not just Europe, uh, and of course the Asian original migration into, into, into here. But uh, we, we don't have time for a, <laughs> the, uh, a, a definition of hemispheric. All I would say is we need to start thinking you know, as boldly as the Europeans when they thought of the, of the Erasmus program. You know, I know we don't have a European, uh, there's only a European Union, and even that is being placed at risk by the very troublesome rise of nationalism and exclusion and people who want to build walls. We need to combat that tendency to segregate the, the, the new rise of nationalism, which has been always the force of the most destructive forces in the world, or as Einstein called it, an infantile disease, with the universality of knowledge in a way that's deeply respectful of local traditions. As Dr. Ram was saying, you know, the concept I like is the concept of global. You know, you're at the same time global and local. You take this global public good, which is knowledge, and you don't adopt it, you adapt it to ro local reality. You take the wealth that comes from local, from understanding of local reality, and you aggregate it so that other people in the world can learn about it. This is what universities could do, but we need new forms of organization. Let every university admit its own students, do all the administration, but then let's create a common educational experience for students. And this would be the best way of developing global citizens, as, as you say, who are locally rooted and grounded, but understand the, the dynamic of reality. By the way, if we did that in a well, w good and organized and integrated way, we may all also combat brain drain uh, because, you know, we would be from the outset allowing people in low resource settings to experience the best that we can offer in uh, uh, universities in, in the richer part of the world, but in a structured framework that then allows them to come back and uh, contribute their, their wisdom in, in, in this way. And we would allow our students to develop the same global uh, perspective by having a shared common experience. The same thing with research, a complementary rather than a mutually exclusive competitive zero-sum game, which is what we've been uh, used to in this idea that we are. It's the difference between dependence, you know, we'll train your people and then keep the best here, Independence, everyone will can do everything, which we cannot do. And what I'm saying is we need organizations that are up to the era of interdependence. Uh, that is, I think, um, uh, our, our biggest challenge and our biggest potential. Well, thank you, Julio. Uh, Dr. Ram. 
I uh, understand that even today, uh, about 12 or 13 percent of the students at the University of Kathmandu come from countries outside of Nepal uh, to do their studies and to provide that learning and knowledge in their own settings as well. When you think about the role of the university in a global setting, how important are institutional partnerships from your point of view for you to achieve your own objectives? Um, I am a little jealous uh, how well our friend uh, Frank was answering about the globality. Uh, we don't think different at all. This is very, very nice. I don't want to repeat any sentence we have already discussed. One thing here, your presence and your presence uh, gives me the feeling I can be talking as I am. So one thing I want to say here, knowledge. What is knowledge? Let me compare knowledge with chicken. <laughs> you know, why chicken tastes a little different in San Francisco than in Nepal? <laughs> chicken is shame. Knowledge is universal, whatever we share. There's no different knowledge, you know, whether it is physics or chemistry or medicine. Need is the same, but the difference what makes is the essence, how we cook and prepare and implement. That should be the topics uh, for the leaders of global, global citizen, global health leaders. The simple reason I am telling here is, you know, Kathmandu University, uh, one of the youngest universities in this country, this year we are celebrating our Silver Jubilee. It has, talking about the medicine, it has also here partners in the United States, among many others, simply University of Washington in Seattle, mm -hmm. Stanford, and other universities there. And also we believe South South University corporations, among many others examples, just University of Kathmandu University with uh, Korea, South Korea, Seoul National University. It was started with very, very simple, modest, small collaborations, inofficial collaboration, people to people. Academician to academician, student to students. Simply now coming to your point, why I value the students. You know, as a doctor, I always value the wish of the patient. As a teacher, I always put my students in the middle point. They are the end consumer of our power of knowledge. Let's convince them what you dream, what you have in your mind. Not only sharing people of, at a knowledge level, but also sharing what you appreciate the most to feel that they will be one day a good citizen at that particular region, particular community, and they will be the global citizens because simply the need, the fastness, rapidness of our children are different than we are. They are much more faster, dynamic. And simply where we can empower them is to give some experience what we have to mix with their dynamism. They are much more capable, much more stronger so coming back to the global students exchange at our university, as a young boy living in Europe, I got many things from Europe. This is a way how I personally felt I have to give back something good I appreciate the most on my own to this continent. This is a way how we started from student to student. Then came the faculty to faculty and professors to professors and now it is multifaceted, bigger collaborations. And often we always say, how big is the collaborations in context of budget? I don't think this must be the prime issue. If you have something more, what I wish the most, need the most, why I should work so hard if we believe each other to get the same thing? Inclusive money, inclusive partnering, inclusive friendship. If I need something in the United States, do you think that a country like Nepal needs some more connections than what we have here today? I will do everything to make you strong so that you can support others to support Nepal, if I believe it, if I think that's the correct way. Let's not duplicate our resources and values. Let's multiply it to address where the need is the most. That's a simple, you know, let's not think too big Think small at the, 
at the grassroots level, many people need at this level as our knowledge. Here, global is only successful when you think and act locally. That's simple. So about medicine, this is what we believed, what we practice, and where we are today. I'm very, very happy that uh, more than 13 till 15 percent of my students are from outside of Nepal, and they are the brand ambassador of us, and inclusive many, many students from the United States of America. Because the origin of the problem, they will witness at the place where the problem lies. Where the need is the most, the opportunities are also the most great. So this is a way we have to share, I want to share with you. And together, again, we can always multiply the good things in coming days as well. Thank you very much. Um, uh, President Napolitano, I wanted to come back uh, to you for a moment. Uh, you know, the most of us attending the consortium gathering of uh, universities for global health are faculty and students and administrators committed to the field of global health. Uh, what advice would you give faculty and students and others in a university who wanted to see their university become an even stronger force for advancing global health? What would you suggest to them of what they could do? Well, we'll, we'll all hear words like collaborative, interdisciplinary, uh, uh, you know, intersecting perhaps with other universities that are doing some of this uh, uh, work, uh, and, and the multilateral agencies that are involved. Um, I, I, you know, universities are, are complex organisms themselves, and so you have to figure out uh, how do you get beyond uh, those kinds of terms into something that will help your needs and your priorities uh, get the attention they deserve uh, and get that attention uh, from, uh, say, the president of the university who's constantly being uh, asked to fund this, support this, find space for that. Um, and so w one idea, and, and I, and I uh, say this as a recovering politician in a way, <laughs> um, is you, you've got to put a face on it that somebody who's not in the field can appreciate and understand. Um, uh, today, for example, um, you would make, uh, you would take Zika uh, or Ebola, and you would say, uh, this is a global problem today that affects the entire globe. Um, and here's how, and here's the why, and here's what we can organize ourselves uh, in order to play a major role and educate our students on how to play a major role. Or alternatively, you could pick a major uh, global challenge such as um, climate change or food security and uh, uh, something that is already um, a, a focus at university and say, and this is how global health intersects with that. And this is what we can do and this is what w how we can educate our students, and these are the faculty interactions that would really be helpful to support. So uh, I would take all of the, the, the kind of benign statements we make about uh, global health, and, and I agree with the, the comments made here by my, my fellow panelists today, but then, and then you put, put a very, uh, um, firm face on it, something that someone not dealing with the field all the time, every day, will understand. Great advice. Thank you very much. Um, Julio, you, you've only been a president for a short time relative to your long career in this field, but already I know you've thought about how faculty and students could uh, advance the cause of global health wherever they may be. Uh, what advice would you share? 
Well, <coughs> you know, before um, my current position, I, I was almost seven years dean of a school of public health at Harvard, a school you know well, uh, uh, since you know I fulfilled my dream of being Harvey's successor. Um, but but you <laughs> and and I remember when I was being recruited, the, the president of the university, Drew Faust, asked me uh, what would be an indicator of success, and I said if if we can succeed in making the, the global part of public health, which is all of public health, global health, a matter of interest of every part of the university. If, we, if that would be, for me, an indicator of success. So my main advice is, you know, we have to champion, be exactly the opposite of empire builders and wall builders. We need to push this and show the relevance. You cannot be an economist today if you don't understand that the largest sector of the largest economy, the US economy in the world, is the health sector, and that healthcare is 10% of the global economies. You cannot be a political scientist, you cannot be an ethicist, you cannot be a life scientist if you don't appreciate the huge potential that human health offers as problems with which to utilize the life sciences revolution to start understanding fundamental processes of biology, but also developing solutions for people in resource constraint. You cannot be interested in engineering telecommunications if you don't see the, that one of the areas of greatest potential is there. You cannot be a big data scientist if you uh, fail to understand that some of the biggest applications are exactly in the health realm. So to the extent we are, um, a, a, you know, we, we, we offer this set of problems which are at the core of our survival as a species and the, the survival of our planet and offer that to mobilize all the talent, then I think will be helpful. And then the students become a very important um, vehicle for low allowing that in, in integration. That's why, you know, typically institutes or programs on global health become great connectors because to the extent you can develop, as, as I know UCSF has done, programs, masters, doctoral programs that then involve every part of the university, the students themselves become vehicles. And then, you know, if we did what I was, you know, this uh, view, which I don't think is utopian, of global forms of organizations, the students and the faculty interacting could be these agents for change and a more enlightened pathway to, to, to um, in, in interaction among humans across the, the globe. By the way, I just want to mention something that President Napolitano m mentioned in passing and it's the power of technology. I mean, today, you know, when we think of global forms of collaboration in education, particularly in education, also in research, but particularly in education, I think we, we you know, we have, a, we are the, at, in the middle, at the threshold, I would say, of a true revolution in education. For whatever reason, education was one of the very few fields that did not experience a technological revolution in the 20th century, compared to medicine or transportation. That revolution is happening today, and the advent of high quality, highly interactive, engaging uh, elements of online learning that can really uh, um, uh, power this form of consortia I was talking about with multiple universities around the world generating content and then sharing the content through platforms that today allow a level of, of, of interdependence that is now feasible, that doesn't require people to, you know, necessarily to travel, although I do think there's a lot of space for for face-to-face -face interaction among students. But, but that idea of sharing an education experience today is more possible than ever because of the technological revolution. So global forms of organization, of academic organization, empowered by the technological revolution in education, I think that could, um, could be uh, uh, enormously energizing for, for, for faculty in every field and for, for students around the shared problem of health. Well, thank you, Julio. Uh, Dr. Ram, would, what advice would you offer uh, faculty and students who want to do more for global health? Uh, we have already discussed collaborations, global health. And one thing here I want to share is uh, simply, in coming days, global health uh, should put more focus, if it is possible, to reach the areas where the need is most, to add this first, that is the foremost. And second, we believe on a 
future, future, young youth students are our future. So no matter what we share with them as a knowledge, it should be implementable, packable, transportable, and outpackable knowledge. I simply give you some example concerning the faculty development. I am a surgeon professionally, but uh, not always the best surgical teacher are the best surgeon. Neither best surgeons are the always the best surgical teacher. And second here, concerning the students, you know, often we teach and tell them about Rome without giving any moment of chances to visit them Rome. So if our student can visit Rome and read about Rome and tell you about Rome, that's a little different than being never in Rome, just listening about Rome and telling you about Rome. So the reason I'm telling you here is, you know, country, most of the country in this earth, how they conceive global health is simply, they have the most need. If our students can see the origin of the problem, difficulties, and instantly put their knowledge to address the need, I think they are the best global citizen of the earth. Let's concentrate on this way. I mean, it is nice to talk about global, always. But always let's try to focus what we want to bring these students, these young generations, about the global. We have to empower them to implement their knowledge where the need is the most. I think if the need is most in developing countries, let's encourage them to visit where the origin, origin of the need, where the origin of the difficulties and problem is. And that's the two poles. I always supported and believed to interact, exchange. And we are here not to give and take. We are here to share our strength. And this is what I want to share with you today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Ram. I think we've uh, concluded on a note very much the way we began on looking at the problem of global health as a problem of interdependence and mutuality and not a question of only giving and getting, but sharing. We've heard uh, in this uh, last round that it's important to put a recognizable concrete face that will be meaningful to those who are not of the global health field so they will understand what we are trying to accomplish. Uh, we've heard how important it can be to reach out to fields and programs and disciplines that are not traditionally part of the health enterprise to help them to do better by virtue of engagement and understanding of the global health mission and enterprise. And we've heard how important it is to gain on the ground knowledge. All of this uh, definitely supported by uh, technology. And finally, I think we've all been urged to visit Rome, uh, <laughs> which uh, is of course a good idea no matter what. Uh, by all means, please join me now in thanking our three great leaders for helping in this wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you, President Frank. Thank you, President Napolitano. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Ram. We're very grateful to you all. So we, we're coming to the end of this very, very exciting conference. And um, it's uh, my honor to ask uh, President Napolitano uh, to give us some uh, closing uh, remarks. As uh, we all know, President Napolitano is uh, the president of the um, best research university, public university in the world. Um, I'll uh, allow my friends to have a seat, all right. Um, so doc, Dr. Napolitano, she said doctor of law. Um, we know that uh, she is uh, a recovering politician 
Attorney General of Arizona, Governor of Arizona, Secretary of Security, of Homeland Security, um, and now President of uh, UC. I think we are extremely fortunate to have her as our president. Uh, she's a very skilled politician, even though she won't uh, admit it anymore. <laughs> she gets things done. She gets things approved as uh, we haven't seen before. And, uh, but not only a very skilled um, negotiator, she's also someone of tremendous intellectual acumen, reflected on the visionary initiatives uh, she has created, um, including those of uh, global impact, um, the global food program, the global food initiative, the innovation and entrepreneurship initiative, um, the carbon uh, neutrality initiative. She alluded already to the UC Mexico initiative that I'm so proud to be part of. Um, so we have someone who has the intellectual acumen, but also um, the personal integrity that it takes to be the leader of UC. Please join me, John F. Napolitan. Well, uh, thank you, and I, I am delighted um, that the consortium of universities uh, for global health has returned to San Francisco where it was founded. I am proud of the role that UCSF has played uh, and I'm proud of uh, the involvement of our other campuses and our Global Health Institute. Um, and I'm uh, really delighted at the, uh, the presence of so many of you here today uh, because as we just heard um, Julio uh, Frank uh, kind of list, you know, if you don't deal with health, you don't really deal with the world. Uh, and uh, we all share as university leaders and faculty members uh, a role in educating the next generation, a role in knowledge creation and research, and uh, a role uh, in public service. And Health is such a unifying concept among all of those things. Uh, and so I think we have a number of tasks ahead. One is institutionally, are we well seated? Are we well situated? Are the collaborations and the interdisciplinary uh, natures of our work that we keep talking about, uh, are, do we really um, have it in the right place? Uh, are our students energized? Are they getting opportunities uh, uh, to, for example, um, not just study about, I'll use Dr. Nam's city, Rome, uh, but uh, perhaps to travel there and, and vice versa. Uh, and three, are we really thinking about uh, global health in an, in an interconnected way that appreciates uh, really the full, full array of disciplines that are involved. Uh, from those that are more classically health situated uh, to, as, as, as mentioned, the issues of history, culture, political science, sociology, uh, all of these things that go into an appreciation of how the globe is interrelated and what can be done to make the globe a healthier, uh, a healthier place. That's why I'm excited about this work. I think it goes to the essence of what universities can do, what great universities can do. And I'm humble enough to say the University of California uh, is in that, uh, in that league. So with that, uh, as we think about what we're doing today, but also what we need to be thinking about, uh, I wish you uh, the best on your return journeys, I hope. The consortium and the conference have opened up some avenues uh, for thought and that we will see some re-energized uh, collaborations, partnerships, and maybe some new ones that have arisen out of the last few days. Thank you very much.
I'm Pierre Buchens, the uh, new chair of the board of CUGH, and I would like to thank President Napolitano for very inspiring closing remarks. I would like to thank Jaime and the organizing committee for a superb job. This was a fantastic meeting. Thank you, Tim, uh, and thank you to uh, the board for having been, uh, being so involved um, in this process. Thank you, Keith, and uh, thank you to uh, the staff. They really uh, made this possible, and, uh, and again, I, I was, I'm really energized by this meeting. So let's have a round of applause for all of them. Now, I would like to invite you to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, next year. It will be an interesting time in Washington for many reasons. Uh, but one is that, <laughs> many reasons. One is that it's, uh, it will be the 50th anniversary of Fogarty, and we're going to link this uh, meeting to this uh, very important anniversary. It will also be a very special meeting for us because it will be organized by uh, Johns Hopkins and DC area universities, uh, but they will be for the first time a co-host, which will be Macquarie University. And that's the first step to really make CUGH more global, which is really what I would like to achieve with all of you during the next two years. So uh, be in Washington, uh, in between that, please stay in touch with us. We have many, many committees, very active, many activities planned, and uh, have a safe journey back home and enjoy uh, San Francisco for the rest of your stay. Thank you.